Today we're finishing up our series, Pink is a New Black. How many enjoyed the series? So over this series, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the prison of misconception, where a lot of people are missing the concept of what God wants to say and do. We talked about marriage misconceptions. Thank you in the back. We talked about money misconceptions. And then last week, anybody remember what we talked about? Authority. We talked about management misconceptions. Do we serve God only because he's good, or do we serve him because he's simply God? And we bent our knee to his holy throne instead of the bone throne. Um, today is going to be really different. And so we're going to talk about mortality issues. Um, let me say this. These services are planned well in advance. So today is so unique because we're talking about life and death, and my mom just passed away this week. When you think about it, don't awe, don't get depressed, I'm happy. You want to know why? She is in the presence of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for the last two years, we've been saying this, you either believe the word or you don't believe the word. I believe the Bible, and the Word says when you're absent from this body, you are present with the Lord forever. So she's up there saying, why are you on? I'm in heaven. Just saying. So, but it's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't mean I didn't have my days. I'm not saying that. But God gives us a new strength when we have a renewed focus on his purpose and his plan. And so um, we planned this service a couple months ago, and uh, then there was an opportunity for us. Um, Coach Gill at Long Island University said, well, you know, I, I would love to invite Casey Bethard to come and, uh, and to be part of a weekend with us. Would you ask him? And I said, of course I'd ask him. And guess what weekend Mr. Bethard said would be the weekend that would work for him this weekend? The weekend we're talking about life, death, and Jesus as Lord. Now, when you think about that, I don't believe in coincidences. That's a bigger amen spot, guys. Because you know. like, if you do, you're probably playing a lottery, and you're probably broke because you're playing a lottery. That was in our money misconception sermon. What's dumber than buying one lottery ticket? Buying number two. Okay? Um, but I don't think there's any coincidence that happen in life. I think everything happens on purpose, for a purpose. So in 1999, there was a teenage girl in our church, way back, upstate New York, that was a photographer. And she took this picture, and as I was moving and unpacking, I came across this photo again. Know, you won't be able to see it, but it is the entrance to a cemetery. And over it, this is in upstate New York, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. And I looked at this, and I saw it this week. And I said, I'm so thankful that the word is still alive. Now, what most people think, I'm the resurrection and the life, but they don't know the rest of the verse. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he was dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so I was thinking to myself, what concept has the church missed when it comes to death? We've made this our home. That's what we missed. This is not our home. God has a plan and a purpose in this life, but this is not the end. This is just the beginning of what God has designed for all of us. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. So this week, my mom, as she made her home going to heaven, as she walked into those pearly gates, I guarantee she found her way to the nail-scarred hands and feet of Jesus and bent her knee there. And she said, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Because she made her entrance. 
See, the misconcept is we should grieve differently than the world. I grieve, but I grieve with hope and expectation that one day when I breathe my last breath and I breathe my first breath in heaven, that I'm going to see my Savior too face to face, but not just Jesus. I'm going to see mom. I'm going to see dad. I'm going to see everybody that's gone on before me. Now, my grandpa, my grandma, but in that, there's still pain. There's still challenge and there's still difficulty. So I have no notes today. So I don't know what I'm going to say. There's still things that we all go through in life. Some it's death. I've had a tough year. I lost my dad in March. And I lost my mom November 1st. I'm still up here. I ain't thrown in the towel. And so, it all comes down to perspective, doesn't it? It comes down to perspective. When you miss the concept of death, you will be miserable when death knocks. But if you understand the concept of death, that death is not a denial, death is a doorway, then you're like, I can celebrate. Oh man, but what if you get the COVID? What if you die? What if you die from this? What if you die from that? Listen, you're going to scare me with death? I have a perspective of death that it is a doorway to eternity. It is not the end of all things. It's the beginning of new things. The very thing that we live on earth for is heaven. The only way to get there, you got to die. Death. It's not an easy subject to talk about, is it? Because it's the unknown, and we get scared or terrified by it. But I do know this about death. The Bible says this in Romans. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death has been removed by a person called Jesus. Because he is the resurrection and the life. Two years ago... Just almost two years ago, we're about a month short of that, we had one of our Long Island University football players, tragically, his life was taken from him early. Clay Bethard, and most of you have walked this journey with me and several of our teammates from LIU, and you've walked this journey and to see a young man's life taken from him. Man, it's painful, isn't it? To see my mom, 82, still painful. It doesn't matter what age or stage someone is, death is often painful. So let me talk to those who are grieving someone. Two years, I lost a great young man. I lost my mom and dad, all within the last two years. The most impacting deaths I've had over my life, five of of the most impacting three happened in the last two years, where I grieved harder than I've ever grieved before. Have you ever been there? Where it almost felt like sometimes you were suffocating because the weight was on your chest. If you haven't, you need to dial in today and listen, because one day you might feel that weight. And what we're going to talk about today might lift that weight, that burden from you so that you don't have to think you got to carry that weight alone. And so I look and I say, man, out of all that, I had a friend of mine, Brian Raniolo, 19, I think it was 91, committed suicide. That impacted me. He was the quarterback of our football team. And I was like shocked. I went to seminary, came back, and was going to a funeral. Shocked me. My grandfather, his death, a battle about 12 months to lung cancer, to see a guy who boxed in the Golden Gloves, who actually uh, sparred Joe Lewis, famous boxer. When he realized he could never beat Joe Lewis, he retired. That's a true story, by the way. I have some of his clippings from that. And so you look at him to dwindle from a 
pound frame to under 100 pounds. Young man at 10 years old watching that is it's hard to see. Seeing that, I, first child I ever dedicated to the Lord was also my first funeral. I've seen loss and I've seen it, but there's a difference when those who understand that loss is only temporary and those who think loss is eternal. See, when you lose a loved one that knows Jesus, they're in the presence of the Lord. When you leave this planet, you'll be reunited with them. Now, two years ago, I never ever thought that while I was getting ready for our Christmas production, it was Saturday, it was our final rehearsal, and we were doing Scrooge. I was in full costume, I was on the bed at one point, and all of a sudden, my phone is just being lit up with text messages and uh, phone calls. I'm like, what the heck is going on? All from LIU football players. I literally end up at one point saying, man, I got I to find out what's going on. I literally get on Joe Amalfitano. I said, Joe, what's going on? I walked out into the lobby, and he said, you're not going to believe this, but Clay was killed last night. I literally fell to my knees in the lobby of the church. I could not, I was like, I was just texting him a few days ago. Never would I have thought how that young man's life has impacted my life. Never would I have imagined how that young man's life has impacted now a university. You think about what God's doing at Long Island University, it's unbelievable. When you think of this weekend alone where our guest today, Casey Bethard, was able to share Jesus boldly and unapologetically for 120 players and their coaching staff on Friday night to share his story and to not hold back. He asked me, how bold can I be? As bold as you want to be. And Casey went in, I'm sitting here thinking, this is a university in New York and we're sharing Jesus. I mean, but most of that would not have happened without the passing of Clayton King Bethard. And so I carry, and most of you see all the stickers on my Bible every Sunday. These are because they mean something to me. But the first sticker I ever put on this book was CB4, Clayton Bethard, number four. This is a reminder to me that every moment matters and every second is significant. Yeah. That every life God has called us to minister to. Yeah. And so even in here, what you don't see is often on the first page, I didn't even show you this, KC. CKB with a crown. Clayton King Bethard. To always remind me that no matter what I do, no matter how busy life is, is never too busy to touch someone's life with Jesus. I have a personal mission statement since I went into ministry at the end of the long days and late nights. Did anybody hear about Jesus? And I can tell you this, Long Island University is hearing about Jesus. And it's hearing about him in greater ways. We do a Bible study with football players, nine different sports now. Um, we do a coach's Bible study on Wednesday. Over half the football coaches come to Bible study every Wednesday. Unbelievable. I mean, they curse like sailors, but they're l trying to learn to love Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's true. Amen. Before every game, I do a pre-game Bible study with any, any of the players that want to come in. Casey was with me yesterday doing that. It's beautiful to see. And before every game, Coach Gill prays over his team. Just, I won't say what he says before he prays, <laughs> but you know, I thought as we're talking about this concept of death and life and purpose, I know he hates to do this, but Casey, would you come up? Can we have a conversation for a few seconds? Come on, would you welcome <laughs> Mr. Casey Bethard? Oh, thank you. 
Man, what an honor to have you, Casey, Casey with us today. No, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm grateful, grateful yeah. to be here. Yeah. Riding around with you this, <laughs> this weekend, and it does, it feels like we've known each other forever, and I honestly, I believe that uh, that's the Holy Spirit working, showing us we did, we have in yeah. spirit, you know? Yeah. Now, you, um, you and your wife, Susan, obviously you faced a loss that most people would have a hard time recovering from. And I know that's still a process. But can you talk a little bit about those early moments when you found out about Clay? Um, yeah, it's, a, uh, it's hands down the, the worst scenario you can, you can weave into a parent's life. That phone call that you get late at night and... Uh, that Clay's in the hospital and you're like, okay, well, what's up? And uh, it just didn't feel right. It was a, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that you go, you go there and then you end up coming home, walking back in the house at seven in the morning. And it's a uh, surrealness that you can't even, I wouldn't, I, I, I can't explain it and I can't even, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but but it was uh, it was uh, it literally was it was a challenge to to okay now what do you believe now what instead of I, all I knew is that and I'm grateful for this there was it was not why and 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 so much anger it was literally was what now hmm. Hmm. and uh, I. I just thank God that uh, I had a, my pastor back at home, thankfully, it's not a coincidence that he walked through this 10 years prior because as his son was going to say goodbye to people before he went off to college, he rode to the store, he rode to the local fast food joint to see his buddies to say goodbye. They were going here and he's going there and, and it was raining and, uh, uh, he never even made it to the fast food. He ended up driving off the road at 18. And so uh, my pastor was over at the house and um, it, was a, it, was a, it, was, it was a thing where you go, okay, you've been walking this thing and you've been uh, professing these beliefs and these things, but I had to know hmm. I had to know the truth. Okay, now what? I had to believe what God was, had told me all these years about who he is and what heaven is. And so it wasn't, it didn't become just a, a devotional in the morning and try, oh yeah, that's cool. That's great. I saw, oh yeah. It, it became a digging in deep and it started with uh, my pastor and the, and the love pouring in and it, it just a constant church started that day for a constant, I mean, it was three months straight including you. I mean, um, you bring, put in our lives for that. God knew we were going to, he was going to need, Clay was going to need you. I was going to need you. And so, uh, talk about, cause this is a, this is the backstory. Most people won't know. Did y'all want him to come to Long Island university? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, I, I, he, he had gone to a, a school close, he got a scholarship to a school close to us, and he just didn't, it didn't like, it was a, it was a, it was a slow kind of dead town, but a decent football team, and he wanted out, and Clay was the, the third, the third one, like me, a little bit different, had to prove his brothers diff, wrong and do his own thing, it was always about, this is my thing, my journey, let me go, I'm gone. See you later. Don't worry about me. Save the drama. I'm I'm gone. And he, he left. He left this little school in Tennessee to go to back to to a uh, to a uh, junior college on the west side of Iowa. You couldn't pick a further college you go to. <laughs> and I knew he'd pick that one. And he was like, "No, nope, you're not going with me. You're not riding with me. I'm gone. I got to get focused. Don't worry about me." And then when it came time to get re-recruited, there were some schools in the bag and um, that were in the grab bag of schools to, to, to consider. And 
And I just didn't think Long Island University when they, he, he brought that up and I was like, oh yeah, he goes, man, this guy, this coach up there is calling me a lot. And I was like, okay. But anyways, uh, you know, and I, and I knew once he goes, dad, let's go up there. And once we got here, uh, by the way, I was just, I was pleasant. I mean, just blown away. I just love the area. It's just, you guys are blessed with an awesome area and all that stuff. And I was blown away at the city flying in. So it was, it was awesome. And I knew when we got here at the, if you've been through the football program, their minimal stuff, their lack of, uh-oh, oh, their, their lack of, uh, they call it the arms race. When you're recruiting people, you want to have stuff. Yeah. And they didn't have stuff. They had little cubicles for coaches, and they don't have a lot of big weight rooms and all this stuff. And that's, I knew, I went, he's coming here. <laughs> he's coming here. Because he was a minimalist too. He was real, and I knew that coach was so real with him and told him he didn't promise him anything. He said, this is what I expect, and this is what I want. And we walked in. Clay didn't ask to see anything. I want to see, uh, you know, he didn't want... A, sweatshirt he didn't want to see the weight room he didn't want to see big anything he was like i was like I, he's coming here because that this, this it was just real yeah so you think about that right casey when when you look at a place you didn't think you'd see your son is a place that kind of shored up the faith foundation that yeah. you and susan had had poured into him yeah and how does that make you feel now though like yeah. knowing that God still works everything together for good. That's right. That's right. That was awesome. I mean, that's awesome because <clears throat> we always left it to him at the end of the day. And, and we knew that he was always acting on faith. And, then, you know, that's, he, he just always did. It was like, I need to do this. I need to do that, you know. And um, uh, not, you know, in the moment things. There were some in the moment emotional things that he liked to that he, he got into also, but, uh, but these thought and prayerful decisions he made, we kind of trusted him for the most part. And, and looking back now, I mean, it's, it's absolutely mirac miraculous, you know, what God has orchestrated in all this, because there's, there's no way after, uh, it, it'll be two years in December that he went to heaven and, and, uh, we would have been, he probably would have been long gone by now because of his eligibility. I might have come back for a graduation uh, and, and maybe some the next season of games if he got through his shoulder stuff. But uh, there's, I, I have no reason to be here now. And you look at your life and I, you know, I have no reason to, to keep, extend, have this relationship and be speaking up here today because, you know, like I said to the guys the other day, there's probably one person, one person might need to hear something. And, and the Lord, for that reason, you know, has me up here now. It's just crazy. You get on a flight and you're going, I can't believe it. If Clay doesn't go to heaven, I'm not here. We're not here. And uh, I, don't, I don't have this relationship with you. You know, it's, uh, maybe you don't even have a relationship with Clay, you know. He, he saves it for down the road. But, uh, man, it's... It's, it's miraculous what he, what he has done with that, what, what, what man thought meant for evil. Yeah. The Lord turns for good, you know. So Friday night, you had the opportunity to share your story with 120 football players and about 15, 20 coaching staff. And let me tell you, what Mr. Bether did was preach Jesus. Unashamedly <laughs> preach Jesus. He is one of the most humble guys I know. He's literally like, hey, was that okay? <laughs> and I'm literally like, I'm like getting text messages from guys. That was amazing. That was awesome. That was just, but if <clears throat> the circumstances didn't happen that way, there would not be that opportunity to share Jesus with an entire football team. No. That's the miracle of the Holy Spirit and how God works things. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And we have to, uh, and the timing is absolutely perfect all the time. Again, in that room too, you know, I've had opportunities. They've offered things in the, in the 
in the first few weeks and months after that to come hold some kind of service for the family and do some things that were just awesome ideas, but they just they didn't feel right and it wasn't time. I, and then when you reached out to come up this last week, it just, uh, uh, you know, we thought about it, yeah, and then it turned out to be this week. He didn't plan it for this week where he'd be talking about mortality and, 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 and eternity or and, and life and death, and it just happens to work. So what happened was I asked Mr. Bethel, I said, hey, which weekend could you come up? Coach Gill would like to have you come up for a week and we'll have you come in, speak to the team, uh, honor you at a football game, and then have you in our services on Sunday. And he picks this weekend. We pre-plan our services months in advance. I didn't know my mom was going home on Monday. Mm. And we're teaching on loss six days later, seven days later. And then this is the weekend Mr. Beathard shows up. When I say there are no coincidences, there are no coincidences. So now, you had to go through a process, obviously. And um, I know a lot of players, oh, if I could just get that guy in a room that took Clay's life, yeah. I would just, you know, and there yeah. I see him spewing stuff on social media. Um, Talk about how you process that, because here, it's the unthinkable. Right. A, a young man takes a, another young man's life, because for you guys that may not know, um, Clay was at a, at a place in Nashville late at night, and he was sticking up for a friend that was... He had an Uber ride about 30, 30 seconds out, out, and he and his good friend, these are really good kids. He didn't even want to go out that night, but he did. And I look back over it all, and it just makes so much sense why, how he ended up there. And it, it, like it or not, you know, that's where he was supposed to be that night. And um, he wasn't, there was a text to my wife late. He said, leave the door unlocked because I'm coming home. He's not going to drive drunk. He's not that guy. He's not going to do that stuff. So you knew he was under control for the most part. He was good. And... Uh, Told to me because I I won't look at it. I haven't looked at the video, but uh, it's it's evidence and all that stuff. But the um, he's sitting on a curb with his buddies, and they're you can see they're just cutting up and laughing and waiting. The Uber is literally 35 seconds out, and the bad guys from the place that uh, one of Clay's friends had kind of I guess he got them started on something, and and. And it doesn't matter what, how it started, but they just started, they, they, they were beating, up, beating him up pretty good. And of course, Clay and his friend saw the mess and went over and got, stepped in the middle of it. And, and the whole, the, the literal, the whole time lasts, the video lasts, I think, 58 seconds. He comes out of it sitting on the curb and you could see his, his sweatshirt turn color as he's holding his chest and his buddy too they were both they were both stabbed and, and then uh, he uh, the other friend somehow blocked it and he got wounded pretty bad the and I anyways but they uh, they went those two went to heaven pretty fast and um, um, it's a uh, again when you look back and, and count it all together and, and how and why and the things that went on prior to it, the day, the day of and the night before, the time we had that were just never, I mean, first times in all of our lives, first times for him to, for me to ever go, hey, uh, the Holy Spirit's speaking, hey, get up out of your bed. I know you're, he's getting home late tonight. And I, I always, I go to bed early, I'm asleep, I'll see you later, whenever, I'll see you in the morning. I heard him get home that night before off a plane and, 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 and the things that just went through that, you know, the, I just, 11, 12 at night inside just said, hey, go downstairs and hug your son. And I was like, man, no, no. And I like kept laying back down. All right. And I got up and I was walking down the stairs and like he, I mean, it's, this is how, these are just refreshing knowing things. I 
walking down the stairs, and he's like, Pops, what are you doing up? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> I, go, I go, you. And he goes, man, this is crazy. This is awesome. So I, I got to spend time with him. The next day was the same way. And, and it was just an un, unprecedented day that, that uh, was just meant for those, those memories and the good stuff. But anyways, you get home, and, then, and, then it, and it takes some... In the, in, the, in the trying to figure out and understand everything, you got to dive in. And we dove in for months. Love came in. And all, I got a lot of texts like you were talking about. You know, God is close to the ones who mourn. Days of day, you know. And it was, it was nice, but it was like it just didn't help at all. But when you don't sleep and you sit there, uh, you just stay up all night. You look at them. You just kind of go, okay. I'm reading this. I found it where someone texted me this. Now I found it. And what does that mean? Will you help me? I need it. And then you find things. And then you, so everything became a, uh, when, you're, when your friends and your, and their teammates and everybody and then your kids are asking you, I literally, that was my quest. I'm going to find the answer in the Bible. Mm. That's so good. That's so good. And then that's where my walk changed. That's where the transformation came. So that way, when we got back together in the next morning, all the time we were, uh, I was going to know last night when you said, when you, when my sons were talking about what they do in a room with this kid and what they, and I was like, first of all, no, you wouldn't because I know you because you got God in you that you, you couldn't. And I mean, I, I understand fighting back if someone came against you, but if you had to, if you were said, okay, go in that room and kill that guy back for him, there's no way. You can't. It's just, I know you wouldn't. Even, well, uh, you know, yeah, I think, well, all right, Dad, maybe you're right. But, you know, I go, and then I had to find the answers for these things, and I found out where he says, vengeance is mine. <laughs> and it's better, it's like hot coals on your enemy when you treat, treat them good, you know. Yeah. Well, love after that, and I found it, and I was, I go, come in here, listen to this. And I read it to him, and we were in there, and I go, so if you... You can't believe this other stuff about heaven or salvation or whatever, anything, unless you, you can't discount this. Do you wow. believe this? Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, we believe it. I said, so what then? I mean, if you believe that, then you have to believe this. Yeah. So, so it, that's why he does that. I go, he means that for you so that if you carry this bitterness and this hate and this mad around, it's going to kill you too. It'd be taking more lives. So leave it alone. Let go of it. The Lord says, give it to me. So these are the days immediately following this horrible night. And I didn't realize how much I was preaching to myself. You know, Mm -hmm. you think you're talking to other people and you're like, gosh, yeah, that's right. If I let him, I know he's going to deal with this. All these things. I can find, I literally can find, once you know that there's, heaven is real and eternity is real and, and God is good and there's nothing apart, we can do nothing good apart from him. Once you know that, that then all of a sudden you can, you literally can find peace in your suffering. Yeah. You can. Wow. So now... Fast forward a little bit, because you're talking with your boys, your family, about this. Forgiveness. Right. Now, fast forward. You're in a courtroom. Yeah. Across the way is... This guy, and he's sitting over there, and I'm realizing he's just a kid. He's probably 23, 24, and, he, and I start hearing this, where he came from, and from his de- defense, is trying to s- present a case, and they're talking about him. And I could see it on the kid. I'm like, good Lord, man. And, and I'm going, and I knew it with everything in me. That God, that God loves him as much as he does me. Wow. As he does. <laughs> and, and I thought, and I thought, and not only does he not know that, he never had an earthly father that showed him anything, let alone a heavenly father. So I began that, at that moment, I started praying. I was like, Lord, I pray that, I, I, I pray he gets to hear me forgive him at some point. Maybe he read it in articles, I hope. 
But I know at some time when this trial, whenever the trial gets going, if I have anything to say, you know, I know the the Holy Spirit will speak through me, but that's what I want him to hear is that he is loved. And I, and I pray that, that he can, he will go to, I hope that, you know, and I know the Lord will leave what he's doing on, on the LIU campus and what he's doing through our lives as a family, my children, my family, what you, all the things you could turn to and my young kids who were, you know, have turned to just Christ for strength. Now I know that he could take that kid and in prison and just like he did from Saul to Paul, you know, turn a, turn a person over. There's nothing. He did it with me. I mean, I, I literally was not the Lord of my life prior to Clay going to heaven. I'll be honest with you. I knew he was my Savior, and I knew he was Clay's Savior. And that, you know, but there were some things I just didn't, I wasn't digging in deep enough. I didn't know him. I, he was mischaracterizing a lot of things, you know. Uh, I miss, just like, I mean, I misinterpreted a lot of things. And, um, uh, and that's where it, it just caused me, Lord, I said this in the last service, and I think it's important to say that I was spending a lot of time still trying to control my life. I was praying and praying, but I was praying about my will, you know? I wanted him to bless, bless my prayers, you know, and bless my will instead of his will. And I'm, my wife confronted me one day. She goes, you, you, I got to tell you, you have idols in your life that you need to give up. And I was like, okay. And, she, and I go, was that like the bumper sticker, let go and let God? And I go, whatever. And she's like, no, your kids, your, your family has become an idol. And you're a, good, huh? you're a good earthly father, but you need to let the Lord raise them. You need to just steer them to that. And trust, it's a trust issue. So I, I, I didn't, I mean, I, in the flesh, you're just going, okay, you could have all this other stuff, but I don't. I don't know. I know some stuff. I can coach. I could teach. I could take them and I could tell them better than, yeah, I, I couldn't trust them with them. And then when Clay went to heaven, after they going through this about a, a month, at least man, a couple weeks, a month later, you can go, when it finally hits you that, wow, you know, and I look back and go, how was he going to deal with that? How, what did that mean at the time? And now I realize that he allowed Clay to go to heaven to tell me that I have got your son. I have got the one. And then I could realize, oh my goodness, he is, out of all my five children, he is the one that I don't even have to consider anymore. I don't have a worry in the world about him anymore. And I was like, wow. And so when you take that that tragedy and and, and mix it in with that and go, oh my goodness, if now if I could just feel this way about the rest of my children, then it, it just makes, it frees you from all these things that you try to, and I do now because I see their relationship just going to the Lord. And it's just like, I don't worry about it. Man. What's the worst that can happen? What, them go to heaven? What's the worst thing that can happen in our lives? And that's the thing. It's like, if you get a chance, and a lot of things in, in, in the Bible to read, but, I, but, I, but I, I was studying, I got fixed on them, and you were showing 2 Corinthians 4 there, but I started reading 2 Corinthians 5, and it talks about our, our, our worldly tents and, our, and our, that are, everything is perishing. And when it talks about that transition from here, the mortality transitioning from here to there, and it says, and Paul says, swallowed up by life. Wow. It just was a game changer. I said, he is okay. My father is way better than I am. He's got him. And well, one of the most powerful things was, you know, the, the memorial service for Clay. Yeah. Um, I don't know, 3,000 people there, whatever that number was. Is it your church? Yeah. Big church building. Overflow was filled. People yeah. came from all over to, to celebrate. Including him. Mm-hmm. He drove a truck. He drove a van full of, 15 stinking football players <laughs> up and back. And uh, you and Sebastian, and I'm just, I, I'm, it's the first time I ever got to meet him, and I'm just so grateful. And I, I found out the guy that the Lord put in my son's life was just a, just a lifesaver for, for us. And that's, that's the importance, importance of 
fellowship and finding people wherever you go that think likewise, you know. You had, um, when the invitation, Pastor Steve, your pastor, gave the invitation to receive Christ that night. And I looked over my shoulder and saw hundreds and hundreds of people give their lives to Jesus. Yes. It was the first fruits of many more. Um, nothing ever replaces the home going of a son. Yeah. But when you see the seeds of a life and you start to see how God is using all things, yeah. right. even tragedy, for his glory and the good of people who need to hear about it. Yeah. Lives are being transformed. Transformed. Even some of these LIU guys over here today are in church. You know, without the expansion of our Bible study to multiple sports, we wouldn't have some of our baseball players here today. You think about out of tragedy, God brings some kind of victory. It yes. doesn't eradicate the pain or the grief or the process, but it helps you know and remind you there's, yes. there's still seeds. Yes. Seeds, even seeds. in the last service where right. you know, eight people offered their life to Jesus at the end of the service. Seeds from, from Clay's life and the impact yes. he's made. But hundreds of people stood to receive Jesus Christ that night. Um, Listening to you and Susan speak, I called my wife. I said, I, I could not do what they do if I faced what they just faced. But yet, it was the Holy Spirit that gave you guys yeah. an amazing grace. And, and I said this, I, you know, and I, you know, Casey gave me an opportunity to share for just a few minutes. And I, it was one of the greatest honors that I've yeah. had in ministry was to say a few minutes at your son's home going and celebration of life because to see the impact of a young man and how that young man's life yeah. is still impacting. I shared this scripture, um, Jim Elliott, or this quote, Jim Elliott, missionary uh, to the Aka Indian tribe uh, in Ecuador, said this, I seek not a long life, but a full life for design. And every time I think of that scripture, I think of, I think of your, bo your boy. Yes. Because he didn't have a long life, but he had a full life. He and sure his did. life is still <laughs> impacting and impacting and impacting. Um, you know, what do you say to someone who may be still dealing with grief and loss? What, what are the things, I know you said the word, but what are some of the other things? Fellowship, you know, things yeah. that you drilled into. Yeah, definitely fellowship and um, finding those, even those that are, who have, have, gone, have gone through it or are gone, or going through it. Uh, but I, I just, it's a, it's a, abs it's just a relationship thing. It's, it's pressing into that relationship because there's no, no religion or, uh, or steps you can really take to get to that place. It's a Holy Spirit transformation that you couldn't, I can't even, I can't explain it unless I literally remember standing there reading texts about scripture. And going, okay, how do you make this work? I mean, really get in me. And I, I remember looking out the window and I cried out. I said, Lord, I need this in me. I need to believe this with all my heart. But I don't even know how, where to start or whatever. I've been, and it just became, um, literally, it was like a fast of everything outside. The, the media and the, 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 everything else, it was just a, trusting in him and reading his word and committing it to our hearts and the, and it, it just sunk it sunk in there and when you dig into that relationship and read more and more of who he's just like we were singing early earlier you know he said it you know if he said it it's it's the truth and um because you can't you can't make all that stuff up and you start going you start devil Starts getting in you and going, ah, yeah, right. Really? Really? You think this. Or you, and if you, now as long as I've been going in and out and back and forth and comparing, and you just can't, you can't make it up. You can't make it up. It's real. Heaven is real. And God is real. And there is one way to heaven. And you accept that the most ex important decision you'll ever make in your life is, is, is accepting him as your savior. And um, 
And, and, I, and I knew that. The thing about it was, it was, you know, I knew that Clay was saved. But uh, way back, but then the, when I found out that he got, went to heaven, that, I mean, when I found out that he was gone from this world, all of a sudden it was like, then what? Oh my goodness, I got to know that heaven is real and I got to know what really, really, really happens. Yeah. Because what if he was, what if he was living in sin? What if he was doing something? What if he was drinking a few weeks? You got to, you got to, you got to, you know, be forgiven. Every, can you get to heaven still? If you, I, these things started just haunting me that first day. And yeah. then I was, then I was reminded by my wife, more wise people than me than Casey it's grace that saves not yeah not that baptism I mean it's not and so so you know so that and then I I, I had to know and that it was Christmas morning I, I interrupted your uh, Christmas you, you had texted me and said pastor can I speak to you and I said hey we're having breakfast so can I call you after yeah. and so we spoke after that so when I learned that he had been continuing in, in church and in a relationship with, with, with Christ, I, I th- I, it was like, what? Wait, wait, I didn't, all, I didn't know all this. Mm-hmm. And that's when I texted you and I said, so tell me about where was he? Because I, uh, and then once I found out that he had recommitted his life to the Lord of just a couple months before, it was like, uh, I just, I, I'm just so grateful. It just changed everything. Then I go, okay, he's good. He's in heaven for sure. Yeah. So I don't even have to worry. I don't have yeah. to think about anything. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think, I think, the, uh, I remember a big question he had for you back in college. His big thing that he struggled with, he asked you in the first, uh, um, one of the first Bible studies, texted you and said, why do, this, this is another thing that points back to answers and the Holy Spirit, God was in every bit of this. One of the first questions he had for him was, why do bad things happen to good people? And it's, it's mind-boggling that that was one of his things. And uh, Clay was a very deep guy and he was always thinking, always wondering and always, and, that, and, it, and it blows me away that that's one of the things that he would have asked. That was after, Casey, the Bible study where um, it was one of the first Bible studies he was at and my, uh, my teaching that day, when life sucks, God is still good. And that's why he asked me that question. That precipitated his question. Why, why do bad things happen you know, to good people then right. if God's always good? And he, and he absolutely is. He's always working it out. He's working things out. I knew Clay had a had a righteous anger in him, he'd always pop off. He'd, if, if, if somebody was getting treated wrong or as an underdog that was getting, a, he, was, he was the anti-bully guy, you know, and um, he had a, such a big heart, but it was, he didn't have much patience for these people. So it was no, absolutely no surprise at all that he stepped into that fight, no surprise. So, and I, and in my deep in my heart and soul, I, we talked about some things. I go, no, well, you got to forgive. And he go, dad, but you know, you know, and he'd pull out the eye for an eye, dad. No, you got to do it. Then I'm like, no, listen, listen. You know, we talk about these things. And, um, and I think the Lord allowed that because he's like, look, he's my son. I've got him. I'm not worried about this. Life. I'm going to take this because I could take a young, good kid's, short life and do exponentially bigger things with this than I can maybe in this situation, you know, and it, the ripple effects are incredible. I mean, look, here I am now, you know, and, and, and so I don't, so now I look at that and it's all perspective. It's a, it's an eternal perspective where you're going, the reality of everything is up here. It's about eternity. You can't see what he is doing. You're, you're only here. We can't see it. And so what bad things, good people, first of all, we got to, what's your perspective of a good person is the guy that, you know, the famous guy that's making my, I don't know. You know, what is it? And what's a bad thing, you know? 
good things, you know, it's not about, I look at it, there's no better thing than, than, than going to heaven. That's, that's the goal, you know, that's where we want to get, and, but it's also, you know, um, but it's also make him the Lord, not just our Savior, yeah, you're going to heaven, that's awesome, but he wants you to be the, he wants to be the Lord of your life also. And, uh, and we trip up and fall in some of those choices that he gives us the freedom to make. Uh, he's okay with them in his permissive will. He's okay with it. He knows that. It doesn't surprise him. This did not surprise me. Well, watch what I do with it. And that's what we got to remember. Every time when we're crushed and all of them we're down, remember that he is building, he's building you up. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, um, I think one of the most difficult things, um, that me and a couple of the guys did was have to pack up your son's room. Uh, you know, um, it was emotional. We prayed before we went in. We, you know, you know, it was tough. But right, right next to his bed was his, we call it the shark Bible because it's blue and black. It's what we give to a lot of players. Was his Bible, San Francisco 49er hat, his lamp. And I said, right there, is just one more evidence yes. that he was so committed to this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So committed. And so, you know, Casey here today on a mission. Yeah. And his purpose is to make sure everybody he knows or every opportunity he has is that people get pointed to Jesus. And so would you close your eyes and bow your heads for a minute?